hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, another session of Python. I uh, am looking forward to it. I hope you are as well. And uh, I would like to start, and I think I probably already know the, the uh, answer to this question, but uh, does anybody have questions from last time? I would be totally more than happy to answer them if you do. All right, well, I do want to thank everybody for uh, coming to class today. I know it's a weekend and I know there's plenty of other things to do. Um, I'm hoping none more interesting. I'll do my best to make that the case. Uh, and I, I hope to make this fun for everybody. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming and, uh, and thanks for hanging out with me. So today we are going to be talking about the list object. The list object is, um, it's, it's kind of a, a humble thing, really. It's, it's a collection. It's one of a few kinds of collections in Python. And basically, you can think of it as an empty box, actually uh, an empty linear box, where you can put all kinds of things. And a list has uh, two properties uh, of interest. One, it, it, it'll uh, take heterogeneous objects, and two, it'll store them in order, okay? Now, to put it in a little bit of context, um, the list is one of the four basic types of collections in Python, okay? It's heterogeneous. That's just a fancy way to say it can be a whole bunch of mixed up things. They don't have to be all the same. OK, um, and it's ordered. A tuple is uh, the same thing. You can have heterogeneous elements. It, too, is ordered. The big difference between these two, as we saw last time, is that a list is mutable, which is a fancy way of saying you can change it. You can add things to it, take things out, that kind of thing. And a tuple uh, does not allow you to change it. It is immutable. A dictionary, we haven't really gotten to those yet, but a dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. And, uh, and a dictionary is, is like an ISBN number associated with the title of a book. Um, it's like an address associated with the person that lives there. So dictionary takes a bunch of keys that are usually easy to remember or they make sense and associates it with something that might not be so easy, uh, might not be so memorable. So dictionary does a crosswalk between names and values exactly the same way as Python proper associates names and values of variables. And, and the reason for that is um, that Python stores its, its uh, name and object pairs as a dictionary under the hood. You can, you can see that if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to be aware of it at all. But uh, you can make your own dictionaries to do whatever you want. And a set is simply a collection of objects. Um, and it, it kind of works like as a set does in number theory, if you remember uh, learning that in school. Uh, you can have unions and intersections and that kind of thing. What makes a set different than all the other objects is that you can only have unique elements in a set. We'll get to uh, tuples and dictionaries and sets in other lessons. Today, we're gonna focus on a list. And just know it's, it's, it's one of the, um, uh, main collection types within the Python standard library. When you use other libraries, you'll have other collections of things, um, but they're all gonna be based on one of these <clears throat> or some, some permutation, some variation of one of these things. Good so far? Okay, so specifically, we're talking about lists today, <clears throat> and uh, we'll go through uh, uh, five different uh, bins of topics, and they're all kind of related to each other, but 
This is just how they're organized. Um, I'll show you how to create a list. It's got a couple of main constructors. Um, show you some of the basic operations. In fact, we'll go through uh, the methods of a list object and uh, show you how to use them and, and put out some use cases for how you might use them. And I'll show you how to link some of these together to uh, do sensible things with lists. I'll show you how to index a list. Now we've talked about that a little bit already. Um, a list is a sequence, right? So <clears throat> a sequence is just a fancy name of, uh, to say that we've got an ordered um, uh, compilation of things. Uh, it's iterable. That means it knows how to loop over itself. Okay. Because it's a sequence, uh, we can get to it by its index values. And like everything else in Python, uh, it starts out life with a, um, uh, an integer index that starts at zero. So the first element is zero, the second is one, and so on. And we can index a list just like we can index any other sequence within Python, okay? So one of the things we can do is make a slice out of it. So we can, we can say, okay, give me a little chunk of the list. I'll tell you where to start. I'll tell you where to end. If I want you to skip anything, I'll let you know. Okay. And, um, and we can do that backward and forward. And indexing and slicing are really kind of the same thing. Slicing is just a little bit more fancy and it, it combines different elements of indices. Okay. And we'll go over some examples of how you can uh, do them frontward and backward, uh, picking individual bits of it out in any order and in any sequence. Okay. So let's, uh, let's turn to some code. And I'll show you the basic constructors. Now, one of the things I really like about Python is that um, you can, the, the objects in Python represent themselves to the world in the same way that you present them to Python, right? So syntactically and visually, it's, it's sort of the same thing. And the way you make a list is with square brackets. Okay. And inside those square brackets, you can put one or more elements. Actually, you can put zero or more elements. If you just do this, you make a blank list. Okay. You can assign it a name. So you might say A equals. It's a terrible variable name, I know. But you don't have to watch me type words like aardvark and injure myself while I'm uh, trying to do that. So A is gonna represent itself as an empty list. Okay, you can, while you're building a list, add stuff to it. So if we wanna make a list of a few numbers, we can do it like that. Okay, and when we ask it to represent itself, it will, nicely represent what we gave it in between square brackets. So you can eyeball the printout of a list pretty easily and know it's a list, okay? The, the places where you see square brackets in Python is pretty much confined to either a list or an index or a slice, right? So it's a, it's a list or a list-like object and ways to get into it. All right, now this happens to be all integers, but the list really doesn't care. Um, so if we wanted to make another thing called C, we'll make square brackets and we can put in a string or a longer string like so. And we could put in a floating point number 
and we can put in a complex number or anything else we want. We could even put in another list. Like so. And if you put a comma after that, it'll make a, a string like this into a one element list. All right. And you know, as you can see from here, you can put in a trailing comma if you want to. I often do that because it makes it real easy to add stuff later. And this will happily present itself as a string, a longer string, a float, a complex number, and another list. This other list is in between its own square brackets. Okay. Um, now Python doesn't really care how you represent it. So if you wanted to make it a little bit more readable, you might say one, two, three, and then you might want to say A, B, C, D, or whatever. And you might be able to say uh, A plus five J. All right, and if you do it like this, you can then put in comments. So, and if you put in a, a trailing comma like this, you have the possibility to comment out or put comments in any of these lines. So, and if we ask it to report itself, it'll be completely happy doing that. So anyway, well, well, one reason I like putting in a trailing comma like this is that uh, it makes it really easy if I'm debugging or something like that, I can just come here and come out, comment out one element of it and the rest of it's all syntactically correct. So I can do that to any of them and re-execute. Okay, so th th this is basically a constructor by um, throwing at it um, uh, exactly what you want to see out of it. I'm going to expand the screen because I'm losing the, the bottom bit of it here. There we go. So I'm going to call this just um, uh, by declaration. Pretty straightforward. Another way you can do a list is using the constructor. And we'll say by constructor. And, and uh, as with a lot of the Python objects we've seen so far, you can just use the name of the object like so, and then give it an argument. And the, the, this constructor will take zero or more elements. So you just say list and you, you have these opposing brackets. Note they're not the square brackets, right? Because list here is constructor is really a function, okay? And if we don't give it any arguments, it's gonna give us um, an empty list, just like we saw before. So this is going to be just exactly the same as just opposing square brackets. If we want to, we can provide the list uh, different arguments. Okay. Um, so if, if we had a, a string like so, it would take this string and make a list out of it. And see what it did is it went ahead and, and because the string is an iterable object, a string is another sequence, the list method, the list constructor went through and it chopped it up into little bits. Okay. Now let's uh let's look at our help on this. Okay. Um, so you can see the constructor here. 
um, will take an iterable of any kind. So we could have given it a tuple or another list or, or anything, as long as it had, had lots of elements. All right, you can see it's got a lot of methods. Okay, and the, the ones with the underscores, you know, are, are, are just what it'll do in response to an operator. So mull is what it'll do in response to a uh, star operator. Okay, and repr is how it represents itself um, if we're working in a terminal or Jupyter notebook. But down here, we get to the good stuff. This is the stuff without underscores is meant for you to operate on directly. So it's got an append method and a clear method. We can copy it. We can find out what's in it. We can make it longer. Uh, we can find the index value of something in it. We can stick something into it. We can get something out of it. We'll go over all this stuff. But it's a, it's a pretty fully functional uh, object. And it's uh, one of the base objects in Python's library. And you notice we didn't have to import anything, right? So, so we can get to a list on a first name basis, just like we can a, a string object or an integer object or a float object. Okay. With me so far? And if we um, wanna give this thing a name, let's call it E. Oop. Let's call it E. And if we ask it for the type of E, we'll learn that Python calls it just what we expect, a list. With me so far? Okay. Now, I know you guys have worked on this a little bit um, in your pre-class. We'll go over now what you worked on. So I've just shown you in code how you can make a, a list using the opposing square brackets and how you can use the, uh, the word list as a constructor. Okay. And, um, and, and here are several examples that you've seen. Okay. In this first we use a square bracket way to make it. And we've got a comma separated list of objects. These happen to be very short strings. Okay, we've given it a word. Okay, and, and we've created a list out of that word. So just, uh, just pause and ponder, as Grant Sanderson might say, and, uh, and try to think of what these two expressions are going to come up with were you to type them into your terminal. Okay. Now, if you said the same thing, you'd probably be right because this constructor is going to take this sequence and pull it apart into its components. Okay. So here's another example where we're gonna just have a bunch of different countries. So we've got a we've got a, a homogeneous list of all the same things, and we'll just print it out, and it'll represent itself between square brackets with each element comma separated. So you see the way we provided it is exactly the same way that it spat it back out at us when we asked. And uh, this tip tells you they're ordered. We know that. It'll retain that order. Okay. So here's another example. We've got a string that says, I quit smoking. We provided it as the single argument to the constructor. And we printed it out. Okay. In the second one, we've made a constructor and we've put that string in between square braces, right? So we've, we've created a list with a square brace notation. 
So just think about it for, for a minute or so and uh, see if you can figure out what it's going to print out. Okay. So what we're going to expect is that since we provided a sequence here as the argument to the list constructor, that it's going to go through here and it's going to split up each element in this sequence. The white space here is a character just like everything else. So we would expect uh, white space characters to show up as elements of the list. Now, if we put this string between square braces, we're asking it to make a one element list. Okay. And here it preserved the entire string intact. Now, when I made a one element list, I put a comma after it. Uh, I like doing that just because it's, or when I did this, I like doing that just because it's, it's um, uh, because I like it. I think it's good practice. And it's exactly how you would specify a one element tuple. And given that the objects uh, list and tuple are pretty much the same, <clears throat> It, it might make sense to uh, use the same kind of syntax when you specify them, but it's your call. All right. Um, as you see that we, we, we've got a lot of different elements here. Um, Joshua went and counted 14 of them, I believe them. And if we wondered, we could, uh, we could use length, L-E-N, against the list and find out exactly. Okay. So this just drives home the point that you don't have to have the same elements in a list. I'll point out that when you start doing data science and, and um, manipulation of numbers, uh, you're gonna find that you have list-like objects. Uh, called arrays or ND arrays or data frames or, or whatever, and um, or series rather in pandas. And the reason you do that is, is you reduce the burden of the Python interpreter to go and retrieve elements. So each of these objects, this integer, is gonna take up a different amount of space, okay? And this string is gonna take a different amount of space, this Boolean object, this floating point. All these things are gonna take up different amounts of space. And if we were to index into a list, like say ask for element one, which is this one, well, the interpreter is gonna to have to go and figure out how big this element is first. And then it can finally get to the beginning of the second element. And the, the second element is gonna know how much space it takes and, and it'll the, the, the interpreter can then grab that number or that value. Um, and I, I, I don't wanna to belabor too much, but, but I'm gonna point out that uh, this is inefficient. Uh, and when you start working with, with real data, you're probably not going to want this style of heter heterogeneity of, of the difference of, of elements uh, just because of all the extra work. If these were all the same size, let's just say let's just say this is an integer that takes up four bytes, and everything else is an integer that takes up four bytes. Well, if you want to get to this one. You don't have to look at all these elements. So you can, you can get to this just with pointer arithmetic. But no worries. Working with small amounts of information, the ease of use and the lack of restrictions on this can be uh, really useful to you. And after all, computers are cheap. And computer time is cheap. The expensive thing is you. So anything you can do to make your job easier or make your program more intuitive for other humans looking at it, uh, do it. So, so, so a list is a, a really, um, 
really cool and interesting construct in Python. Okay, so here, here's some other examples. So we've got a list of, of three objects. Okay, we're going to use a constructor, right? And we're going to feed into it an iterable. Okay, so think about how that's going to work and see if you can figure out what you're going to end up with. And I'll give you uh, 30 seconds or so to noodle that through. Okay. What's going to happen here is we're going to feed um, a sequence to the list constructor. That sequence has three elements to it. Now, it's not going to further try to parse out these strings because these strings come to us as intact objects. Right? So you're going you're gonna to make a list out of an exploded version of the original. Okay. And if you make a list out of it, you're just making a list out of this intact object. So what you're going to end up with in the first case is you're going to be grabbing the intact elements of the input list, right? There's only three of them, right? We're not, we, we didn't further split up the word Joseph or Clara's way. In the second instance, we made a list out of an object. And this is our object. I got a little too much of that. Okay. This is our object, our list. So we have a one element list. And that single element is in itself a list. Okay. So in the first case, we grabbed <clears throat> Joseph, Clarice Way, and 2020. All right. We split that into three bits and we made a list out of those three bits. So we ended up with the same thing, didn't we? And the second we took an object, it doesn't care what object you give it, okay? And because we put it in between square brackets, we made a list. Is that, is that clear to everybody? I can see how that could be a little bit confusing. No, okay. Okay, so what can we do with it? Well, we know how to create an empty list already. Okay, now we can insert and we can append things to a list. Okay, append means, it's an English word that means uh, add something to the end of, and insert means you put something in the middle of. Okay. Um, and let's actually do some code here. So <clears throat> let's see, we've got a list called E, don't we? All right. And let's add something here, make it markdown. Let's say append. And that append is a method on the list objects. So we'll put a dot in here. So if we wanted to put something on the end of this, uh, we could say e.append, okay? And then give it some object. It doesn't care what object. And, and, and we can do one object at a time. So if we wanted to add something like d to it, uh, we could do that and ask it again what it is. And we see we've added the letter D to the end of it. And we can do that all day long. And here we can add the uh, none object. And we have another object added. So that's really easy. All right, now, one thing I'll show you in addition to this,
There's something called extend as well. Extend works kind of like a pen in that it'll put something on the end. So if, if we wanted to say e dot append, and we gave it another list, let's make it one, two, three. It's going to add our new list. So we'll have an element after none that's our list. Okay, so this is a single element. Um, if we wanted to say e dot extend, and then let's make a list of four, five, and six. What extend did is it acted as an exploder. Okay, so it, it's kind of like the, the constructor for a list if we give it a sequence. So in this case, it, it took four, five, six as individual elements and it added each of them independently. So if we wanted to say, um, uh, X, Y, Z, like so it'll do the same thing. <clears throat> it'll explode the sequence into its component elements. So extend works just like the list constructor. So I just put a note here. It works like list, but appends. Okay, questions on how that works? All right. Um, let's see, you can also do an extent or an, 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 um, an insertion. Okay. Um, and when you insert things into a list, what you're going to do is you're going to tell it where. Let's make a. Okay. Now insert is you're going to, you're going to stick it in there um, somewhere. And let's just make a, a, a simpler list to start with. We haven't picked on F. So let's make F list and we'll make it give it a sequence like this um and we'll ask it to print out so there's our list now if we want to say list dot insert um we have to tell it where and what Now, now where is the index point? So this is uh, so if if we want to say um, uh, f dot insert, and we want to tell it where, like one, and we want to tell it what like xxx we're going to perform an in place operation that's going to say okay let's find index point one so zero one and then right before index point one we're going to add our new value okay now one thing I would point out here, you know, I just said this is an in-place operation. Um, and I'll, let's see, yeah, just side note here. Uh, lists are mutable, changeable. Um, so do in-place operations. Okay. 
what does that mean? If we if we had a string like xxx and we called it string, and then we said string dot lower. It's going to give us a lowercase value of string, but the string is intact, right? We saw that last time because uh, strings are immutable. But so, so we do not do an in place operation on a string. We do do in place operations on a list because we really we, we really end up with the same object when we're done. Right. So if we wanted to uh, ask uh, what the ID of F is here. And then we wanted to say F dot insert and we'll go before the first index point again and add something to it. We'll have Y, Y, Y added just before the first index point. And if we ask for the ID of F, uh, we get the same number. And that this is just a decimal representation of the place in memory where the object F lives, right? So we do not create a new object. We just modify the object that already exists and is known to Python by the name F. So the amount of memory behind the scenes is flexible, okay? And, and the operations to extend that memory is necessary are not visible to you. You don't have to care about them, all right? Which is a, a, a different way um, of working than with an, immu in, an immutable object, okay? Um, if you just say, <clears throat> um, let's see, you can say f dot insert. And if you um, say zero, what that's going to do is add whatever to the beginning of the list. All right. And uh, I think I think you can say minus one. I might be wrong, so don't kill me if I am. Yeah. So what you're doing is 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 Minus one indicates the last element of a list, right? So what you're doing is, is you're saying, well, you're going to go to the last element, and then you're going to go one before it. And that's where you're going to put in your new value. Of course, if you wanted to add a value out here, you would just say append, right? So if you wanted to say f dot append, after C, that would put it at the end. So you can you can shuffle in anything you want to as long as you can find the index value of it. All right. Um, now you notice that these indices are dynamic, right? So even even though we're inserting new things, um, or you know, because we're inserting new things and because the indices are dynamic, the meaning of index point one changes. So if we wanted to say f dot index point one, we'll get a. Now if we wanted to say f dot insert, um, before the beginning, Like so, then we'll get this new string inserted right here as the first element. Now, if we ask for f at index point one again, that will change. Okay, so it's important to know that the list keeps track of its own indices. Uh, the indices themselves are mutable. And the indices themselves will adjust as the object changes shape.
Does anybody have questions on how that works? Okay. So let's let's review that again here. <clears throat> okay, so we can have a, <clears throat> a list of things, in this case, cities. Uh, we can ask it to append something. And what we're gonna do is tack it onto the back. Okay, so this is what we started with. Our indices start at zero. They're integers. They go up by one every time. We added a new element, so we had to add a new index point. Okay. Now we added it through append, so we know it's going to go on the end. All right. Um, so what if you were to create an empty list? And then you uh, added all the integers between one and four. How would you do that? Okay, and the answer is you would just do them one at a time. Um, you can do an append operation for the number one and the number two and the number three and the number four. Okay, if you wanted to do a little less work, you could put the numbers one to four into a list and use the extend method. Okay, so you've got append and extend to put stuff on the end of your list. You can do things one at a time with append and you can do them in a batch with extend. Okay, so this shows you exactly how you would do it using a pen one thing at a time. Uh, can I ask a question here? Absolutely. Could we use insert to do the same thing? Can you say that one more time, please? Could we use insert to do the same thing? Um, not really uh because if you use insert that's a good question um if you use insert okay uh the argument is where okay and then what okay and the where means you're gonna you're gonna add right before you're gonna add something right before it okay now the the if you're gonna use an index on a list um, the furthest out index point you can get is is the is the end of it. So if you wanted to ask it for f minus one, that that asks you for the last element of the list. This guy here. Now since insert is going to put the new thing before that point. Um, that that would then add uh, anything inserted here between C and the thing after C. So the direct answer to your question is, <clears throat> no, you can't use insert to put something at the end of the list. Now, if that being said, if you wanted to get a new list like so, and you wanted to do it backward, you could. What we're gonna try to end up with is a list that is like one, two, three, and four. So you could say g dot insert, and you could say insert just before the end, and you could say 
do four. Okay, and then you could say, you could do this again and, and insert a three and do this again and insert a two. Now I think this will work and do a one. So we've kind of done it backward, but it should work. Eh, not quite, but you, you get the idea. I mean, you, you could figure out a way to insert these things so you ended up with things in the right order. But the, uh, <clears throat> the exercise called for doing it with a pen, so that would be cheating. Okay, and I, I, I'm just noticing now that it's, uh, it's break time. It's actually two minutes past break. So if you have a follow-up question, I'd absolutely welcome it when we get back, but um, we should break now just in case people really need a break right now. So we'll see you right around the top of the hour. And, uh, and by all means, anybody ask questions when we come back. I'll see you then. All righty. <clears throat> and I, th I think I messed this up. Let's, uh, let let's try this insert thing again. So let's say G is equal to a blank list. And we say G dot insert. And we'll, we'll say um, uh, before zero. And we'll say put a four in here. And I think if we say before zero every time, I think that'll give us what we want. Let's try that again. Yeah, there we go. So the, I, I, I kind of messed up my answer before, but if you want to use insert and make a list, you, you can do that, but, but one, and one way to do that is to go backward. All right. Questions? Okay, well, one other thing I'll show you here is uh, remember our old list F. Okay, now if we wanted to insert something in F and, and we wanted to put it before this thing. Okay, so remember we've got, um, we'd say F dot insert and we can figure out where the B is. So we have to tell it where, and that's gonna be zero, one, two, three, four, five. So if we wanna put something before the B, we could say, put it before five. And we could do before B and then ask for F again. And we were able to put in our new line right before the B. That is kind of tedious though, isn't it? Like, like now, now B has changed position or maybe I wanna put something before lowercase Z. And imagine if this list had like a thousand elements in it. Yeah, it'd be kind of a pain. So one, one thing you can do is you can say where, and you can use f.index. And what index will return is the index value of some string like zzz. Okay, so we don't have to count. We can ask Python to count. Okay, and then index is obviously a method built onto the list object. All right, and if we wanted to then say what, and we can just make it a bunch of Fs. So now we can say F dot index or F dot insert we can say where and what using the variables that we made and that will insert the long string of f's before the short string of z's all right and if we wanted to just put make that more compact we could say f dot insert 
and we don't have to have a special variable for where. So the where could be f dot index, and we could put something right before the um, y y y. Okay, and then we can have our uh, something called new y y y. All right, so that'll that, that'll take care of this in one line, where we can go find our insertion point without having to come up with our own number, and then just add our new um, uh, element. Okay, and here's our new y y y. Okay, questions on how that works? Okay. So uh, let's talk about indexing a little bit. Okay, I um, understand you you did some of this before, and I know I've shown you some stuff on how to index a string. Uh, indexing a list is kind of the same thing. Okay, and let's make a new markdown section for your notes. Right now, to make this um, a little bit easier, let's make um, let's make a list called M, and let's make it zero, one, two, and three. Okay, that that way our index, just in English, is going to reflect the index points. Now you'll recall a, a, a list or any sequence in Python is, is, is zero based index. So if we wanted to say M and ask it for the, if I could type, we'd do a much better job. So if we want the, uh, the first value here, we could say M zero. And if we wanted the second value, we could say M one. Okay, so this works just like indexing a string. If we wanted to say m minus one, let's just code for the last index point. Okay, um, we can also do slices of a list. Uh, that means we can um, we can do some subset of it. Let's say we wanted to go two to three, and the uh, a slice, and this isn't just for lists; it's for everything else. A slice is going to uh, basically have the syntax of start, end, and stride, okay. and the default is going to be it's going to start at the beginning of, of the the sequence and the end is going to be the end of the sequence and the stride is going to be one okay um and however a slice is implemented and against what object you're still going to be dealing with the same elements the syntax is going to vary a little bit depending upon the exact object you're working with. And the treatment of the end point is going to vary, but the rest of it will be the same. So if we wanted to take our list and do a slice on it, we don't have to provide all the arguments. If we do a slice just like this, it's going to assume we're going to begin at the beginning and end at the end and stride by one. And one means we're going to report every element of it. So this is just like saying the whole list. Right. Um, if we wanted to begin it somewhere else, 
like if we wanted to begin it at element one and leave the rest of the arguments blank, we could do that. All right, if we wanted to provide the beginning and the end, we could provide element one and element three. And we can accept the default value for the stride. Okay, now the end works kind of like our index, right? So we're saying stop at one before the end point. So we're gonna stop at the position before this, the end uh, argument. Right. So if we really wanted to get three in here, um, you know, the, the, the value three, we would have to do something like M We'd want to start at one and then we want to go to the end, right? So we could say minus one. Oops, sorry about that. That did not work. Um, we just have to leave this blank. All right. If we wanted to um, uh, change the stride and let's, let's add something, let's say M dot append um four and m dot append five and looks let's look at m now so m should be a little bit longer so if we wanted to say m and we wanted to start at one and we wanted to end just before five or four say, so index point four, and we wanted to stride by two, what we'd be saying is we're gonna do every other element. So we skipped element two here. So everybody see how that works. Okay, now, now you, you can also do shorthands. Uh, I, 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 I did all these really verbose where I put the colons in um, and left blank values like here, but we don't have to do that. So if we, if we want a, a single element, we can just make a single element. If we want to specify the first and the last element, we can just do that. And if we want to identify the first element, zero is redundant because it would do that. Um, but we don't even have to define the first element if we want to leave it. All right. Um, but if we do, we can say go from element two to element five. Okay. And then we can put a stride length in here. So we only have to specify as much of this as we need to get our slice out of it. You can always go verbose, but you don't need to. You usually won't, won't see it verbose like this, um, but it's there if you want to use it. And you might find it useful as you're learning it just to remind yourself that you've got three arguments and you can use uh, any of the arguments that you want to. Clear as mud? Okay, and I'll, and I'll point out here that um, that there's a slice object available. Let's call it my slice, and um, and slice isn't part of a list. I'm going to show it to you just because it's it's uh, it's easy, um, and the slice argument has the uh, beginning the end and the uh, stride, okay, but it's a function, okay? 
So here you can define it to be um, two, five, and two. Okay, and then you can use it just like you would this, exactly like that. But this makes a permanent object and it's got a name. So you can say M and then you can say my slice like this. And it'll report exactly the same. Okay, so a slice object is, is useful um, if you're gonna do the same operation on a bunch of different lists or sequences of any kind, you can, you can identify it and then define it at the top of your code and then just use it. And if you gave it a more sensible name than my slice, like, like beginning at two, ending at five and striding by two, you could make a, a variable name like that. You can just use that in here and you'd have some pretty, uh, pretty concise and readable code. The, uh, the thing, the, the only thing about slice is that um, if you if you're going to use a default argument, you got got to be explicit about it. So if you want to begin at the beginning, you use the none argument, and if you want to uh, stop at three, you can do that. And if you want to stride by one or accept the default, you can say something like that. So, so you need placeholders. So if we wanted to say M and then carve it up with my slice one, you'd use this syntax. Now note, that when you apply a slice to apply, you use the square brackets to define, use the uh, curly bra or the, uh, the, the parenthetical braces. And the reason is that with slice, you're creating a new object, right? It's sort of like using a constructor for list where you give it something in between these parens. So it takes these as arguments producing an object. But then when you use it as a slice, and this is a convention throughout Python, whenever you're slicing anything, you use a square bracket notation to do that. Okay. Got that? Okay. Um, see, one other thing I want to show you, as long as we're here, um, is, is there, there's a, a notion of, a, of a nested list. Okay, so we've seen we can make a, a list. We're at N now. And let's actually make this a new section, because this is actually a kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so, so you've seen that we can have a list that has a list in it. Okay, like so. And we could have any other kind of an object in it. Okay, so a list is happy having a list in it. Um, you can whistle up a real simple data structure by making a list of lists. So let's just say we had um, uh, N0 and we wanted to make it equal to um, uh, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And we wanted to say N1 and make that equal to 21, 22, 23, and 24. And N3, we'll make it 31, 32, 33, and 34. 
All right. Now we could say um, n equals an empty list, and then say n dot append n zero, n dot append n one, and n dot append n two. So what we're going to end up with is a list of lists where each one of these lists is going to be an element of n. All right, that's a typo, sorry. Okay. And it's going to represent itself like this. Um, If we want to ask it for the first element of n, uh, we'll essentially get a row. We'll get our first row. And if we wanted to get our middle row, we could say n1. Okay, so, so essentially we can get um, a row dominant uh, data matrix simply by using the, the list object. Now what's really cool here is if, let's just grab the first row again, that's N0. Well, we can further subscript into it because what we get out of here is a list. So if we wanted to get element one out of this list and pull 12 out of it, we could do a second subscript. Like so, All right? So here we've essentially identified the row. All okay, and the, the column is the second. Subscript. So we essentially have a notation of row column to get into our uh, array structure. Now there's, there's nicer ways to do this for sure, but um, this works exactly like um, a NumPy ND array, right? And NumPy is the, the, the basic uh, mathematical uh, library in Python. It works exactly like a pandas um, data frame object, and it works exactly like an array dot array object, which is part of the regular Python library. This stuff might not mean anything to you right now, but just know that under the hood, um, the, the data structures that you'll be working with if you start playing with data science are conceptualized and represented as essentially lists of lists, like so. So it's really important to master uh, all this subscripting and slicing business because you're gonna need it in a lot of places down the road. So it's worth spending time practicing with it. All right, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna belabor too much here, but just to, just to give you headaches. So we've got N like so. Now, if we wanted to say um, an array 3D, um, we could conceptualize that as a list also. We could start with an empty list and we could say array 3D dot append N. Okay, and, and, and that'll give us just what we started with pretty much. And we could append n again, and we could append n again as many times as we wanted to. And this would give you a, a 3D data structure. 
not terribly interesting, but if you have a 3D data structure, you could say array 3D and ask it for element one. And that'll give you the, the middle layer. And if you wanted to take the, the middle row out of it, you could do something like this. And if you wanted to take a middle element out of it, you could do something like that. So you can, you can essentially um, use a nested list in as many dimensions as you want and use as many subscripts as you have dimensions and pull out individual values. Don't worry about don't worry about that right now, but 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 just you know study this and play around with it a little bit when you get time. And um, if you can work with this, this is kind of ugly syntax for sure. But if you can work with this, you'll not have any problem working with um, with high dimension arrays in NumPy. Okay, so let's have a quick review of some of the stuff we've just looked at. Okay, so the basic way to index a list is to use the index number. Okay, so if we wanted to take our word and get index point one, since we start at zero, this is index point zero, and this is index point one, and this should bring the A forward from happy. And if we wanted H, we'd say index point zero. Okay. So let's just say we had a bunch of colors like this. And we wanted the second element. Well, this is zero. This is one. And this is two. So that's going to pull out blue from our list of colors. Uh, here's a list of cities. Okay. And um, we could create a null list and we could append to it a list. And that's going to give us what? It's going to give us a list with a single element. Because our empty list is going to ingest this object intact right so we're pending we're not extending we're pending so we're going to grab this entire list as the only element of our cities well it's not going to show us but um and, and if and if it's not, that's not clear to anybody I'll, I'll show you in code okay so to slice it um, we've got square brackets. Okay, and we're, the first element is going to be start, and that's going to be the beginning. The second element is stop. Okay, and that's where we're going to finish up. And uh, the last one is a step. Okay, I use different words, but they mean the same. So start, end, and stride, start, stop, and step, it's the same. Okay. Left to its own devices, um, uh, the, the, the slice operation will report back the entire list using defaults. If you just want to specify two arguments, what you're going to do is specify the beginning and the end. So see if you can't think about what those will give you. Okay, so we're gonna start at two. So this is gonna be zero, the zero element, the one element, and the two element. So we're gonna start at six. Now we specified the end to be five. And remember, um, 
it's the case with lists and uh, most everything in Python that we're going to end up at one before this. So we get element one, two, three, four, five. So this will report back up to the number eight. So index element four, zero, one, two, three. Actually, it's going to report up to 10. Okay. Now, when I say that, almost everything in Python, uh, there, there are some objects in some external libraries that behave differently. So when you come across a new object and you're, you're, you're doing a slice-like operation, just make sure that, that the endpoint is being treated as you think. It probably will be if you use this kind of uh, algorithm, but it's not the case. It's certainly not the case in some kinds of pandas objects. All right. So this, this should give us from zero, one, two, this should give us from six to eight. Let's see if I'm right. Oh, gives us 10, two. How does that work? Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, yeah, it gives us till 10 because 12 is element five. Okay. Oh, and, and, and you'll note that whenever you do a slice operation, the object returned is a list. Should be obvious by looking at it. But that, that, that means you can, you can do chaining operations on it, kind of like we did with strings. Okay. Um, well, this is something we, we haven't seen before. I'm gonna get rid of my image here. Um, okay. We, we haven't yet seen how, how you can use the range object. Okay. Um, let's have a quick look at range. Don't think we've seen it before. I've got to reduce that a bit. Okay. So range is, is, is actually a very cool object, um, I think. So, so range is, is a built-in part of Python's library. You don't have to import it or anything. Uh, it's recognized as a range. And if you make a range, you use a constructor just like slice. Okay. So the, remember the slice object, you use an argument for begin, end, and stride. Okay, uh, a range object works the same. So if you wanted to um, uh, say, you wanted a range beginning at, at two and ending at 10 and going by two, you could say something like that. And you get wait when you when you do a range constructor like this, you get a range object. So let's make an easy range. Uh, it works just like a slice. So if if you just say range, and you you say ten, that knows how to produce a list of zero, one, two, all the way up to nine. Okay, and I'm going to say knows how to produce. All right, so what this, what range is, is, um, is it something that got, has the potential to produce something, but it hasn't yet produced it. Okay. So this is called like a, it, it, it's, a, it's like a generator object. Um, if you take this and you ask it to produce everything in it, it will. 
But until you do, it just sits there. So let's give it a name. And I don't think we can do this, but let's try. Let's say next R. I think this will blow up. Yeah, um, won't let us do that. But if we if we take this range object, and and this is this is something that will if we ask it to produce all these numbers. Well, how can we ask it? Well, we can make a list out of it. If we say list R, what that'll do is it'll go ahead and create that list. Now, what, why in the world would something just have the potential to do something without actually doing it? Well, this is um, what they call lazy evaluation. Okay, and that's the notion that you don't always need everything out of something. All right, you just you just need to know that it's there and need to be able to get it. So where you see this a lot is like with database operations. So let's say you had a database of, um, of every IP address in North America and you did a query on that. Would you really wanna see every IP address in America all at once? No, no, it, it would bring your computer to its knees. What you want is is one thing at a time, right? And and there's some kinds of generator like objects you, you can apply the word next to, and it'll give you the next one. And and, and return some databases work like that. So you do this query, and and it knows how to do the query, but not until you bang on it does it produce something. So you can, you can keep asking it for one thing at a time and then process that IP address, okay? And your computer is only burdened with one IP address at a time. So this thing, range 10, takes as much space in memory as, let's call this RR. You can say this is range whatever number that is, I don't know. Okay, and RR is just gonna report out that it's got the ability to give you like a million billion or whatever this is, but it hasn't done it yet. Note my computer hasn't died. So anyway, you can um, easily make a list out of a range just by saying list range 10, like so. So if you ever need a sequence like this, um, you don't have to go type it in. It can just happen for you. Right. Now, one of the things you can do with range is you can give it slice-like operations. So you can ask it to go from one to 15 with a stride of three. And, and you'll get exactly the numbers you want, no more, no less. Okay, so here's a task, and I won't bring that slide in there so you can kind of look at what we've, we've done here. The task is to create a list of numbers from one to 10 using range, okay. Now do a slice um, of only odd numbers. Okay, so why don't you think about how to do that? And, and if you've got a, if you're working with a computer right now, see if you can use the computer and see if you can um, 
can produce this result. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that because you've got to do a couple of things right. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, create a range. And it's got to go from one to 10. So we're going to have to start at one. It's going to honor that exactly. And it's going to go to one before the last thing we ask for. Okay, and that's going to produce a range object. And if we use a list constructor, because range provides an iterable object and it's a single argument, we should be able to create our list out of it. Okay, that works. So this is gonna produce a list so we can just chain operations a bit. Okay, and then do a slice operation on it. Okay, now we only want the odd numbers. It begins with one. Okay, so we wanna get the first element. So we'll just do this in a verbose way. So we'll, We'll grab the first element and we'll go to the end and we'll make our stride two. If we make our stride one, which is the default, we'll pick up every number and we'll go one, two, three, four, five. But what we really want is one, three, five, seven, nine. So we'll make our stride to be two. We don't really need that zero in here. So I'm thinking that should work. And yes, it does. All right, you see how that worked, everybody? Okay, terrific. So we're about ready for break. Um, we're, when we come back, we're gonna, um, go through uh, some negative indices and I'll show you a, a few more cool things you can do with uh, lists that are a little bit off the syllabus, but they'll, they'll be useful for you to know anyway. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Uh, let's stop now and see if anybody has questions. All right, well, so far, just to recap, we've, we've covered creating lists by, uh, by declaration. Uh, by, you know, just by providing uh, a comma delimited uh, set of elements between square braces. We've talked about using the, the word list <clears throat> as a verb, as a constructor, and providing uh, an iterable object of some kind as its only argument. Uh, we've talked about how to append things to the back end of a list. Uh, how to use extend to append things to the end of the list from any kind of an iterable. We've talked about how to insert things into a list and using index to help us do that. Uh, we've talked about nested lists and using lists as data structures. And we've talked about using range in a list, and we've talked about indexing. Okay, <clears throat> we've got a few more topics. Um, and one is um, gonna be negative indexing. Negative indexing is, is pretty straightforward, but potentially confusing. And let's, this is a fine list. Let's just grab this and give it a name. And what are we, at? we're probably to P. So let's call this one P. So there's our list. Um, if we want the last element of P, we can say P minus one. Okay, and that'll give us this one. 
Now, if we want the second from last one, we can say P and say minus two. Okay. And if we wanted the third from last one, we could say P minus three. Oops. P minus three. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Well, if we want to, we can use negative indexing to kind of step backward. Okay, so we can say P and um, you'll remember that the, uh, the arguments here are start, stop, and stride. Okay, so if we wanted to, to take P and we wanted to, to start it at, I don't know, seven, and we wanted to end it at three, um, we would get nothing because we started it like here, okay? And we asked it to go here. So we asked it to go backward, but we left our stride at one. So it started here and it didn't make any sense for it to go to the end, so it didn't do anything. But what we could do is say P, then ask it to go from seven to three and ask it to go backward. So that'll start at in index point uh, seven, okay, which is here, right? And then go backward. All right. So so you can you can you can ask it to um, to use negative numbers, and you can kind of reverse the beginning and end point to uh, to to pull out any chunk of it that you want. All right. Questions on how that works? Okay. So. I'm going to show you a few other list tricks you can do. So let's say we got P. Okay, now with a list, the plus sign is meaningful. And the plus sign is another way to, to do an append operation. So this will combine lists. So here what we've done is we've we've gotten our first list here and we've appended the second list. Right? So th this kind of works on like extend or, or maybe a little bit easier we can say one, two, three. One, two, three. And we can add, add to it another list of five, six, Seven. Sorry about that. Of uh, five, six, and seven. Okay. So, so that works precisely like uh, extend. Um, bear in mind that if we um, if we say one, two, three. Let's call it 124.extend. Some interval. Oh, come on. Uh, anyway, um, so this works kind of like extend if I could get extend to work. Um, bear in mind, though, you cannot add to it anything but another list. If you do something like that, it's going to just barf on your shoes and uh, give you a type error. Okay. So this the, the plus operation um, only works with another list. 
Um, actually, let me, let me make another thing here. Okay. Um, so another thing you can do, uh, sorry, let me put this up here. Use this up arrow if you want to move cells around on this. Okay. You can also take a list like so, and you can use a star operator against it. Okay. So if you wanted to make a list with 10 elements with the number five in it, uh, you can do that. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, you, maybe you want some placeholder value, okay? You, you, uh, you, you're gonna have um, uh, a list of attributes for a hundred different subjects. And it might, the attribute might be likes to chew gum, but you know, not that many of your subjects really wanna chew gum. Um, and you might be updating only a few bits of it. So what you might do is you might say none. So you have a list of none and you might make a hundred element list. We'll make this a little bit shorter so it's easier to see. Okay, and those will be your placeholders. Okay, and we might call this Q. And, and now if I want a small Q so we're not talking about Q and on, okay. And we can ask it to rep report Q. Now, if we wanna update only certain subjects, like subject number three, and we might wanna give that a value of one, well, we can do that. And now it's really obvious to anybody that we've got a single value updated. All right. Um, another thing we can do, and this is called a uh, list comprehension. And this is, as far as I know, unique to Python. Don't quote me on that, but I haven't run across it elsewhere. Um, a list comprehension is a way to make a list um, out of whole cloth uh, and, and, and whistle up a list with its contents with a filter all at once. What the hell does that mean? Let me show you. So if you're gonna make a list, you're always gonna start with square braces, all right? Now it's possible to put in an iterating expression. So you can say for I in range 10. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna expand this. So this will give us all the numbers between zero and nine. We've seen that before. And if you make an expression like this, you create a variable I that 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 gets incremented and gets reassigned for every element in range. All right. So let's um let's make something here. Let's just say list range ten. So another way to to do this is to say I. for every I in range 10, like so. So you get exactly the same thing. But these list comprehensions get even cooler than that because if you do this, you're creating I and, and it's this I that you're writing into your list. Well, what you can do if you want to, is you can start playing around with I. 
So you might say I squared for every I in range 10, like so. So you're not only creating this I, but you're doing some kind of manipulation to it. And it'll go ahead and fill in that list with the square root of all these numbers. And it gets even cooler because you can apply a filter Like here, you can say if, and put in some expression that's going to yield true or false. So if you wanted to say something like uh, I modulus two, okay, and and you remember what modulo does, if you it gives you the remainder. Okay, so if you say uh, eighty modulo two it's going to have a remainder of zero. And if you say 81, modulo two, the remainder of this is going to be one. All right, so this expression here, I modulo two, is going to return true, and this is the same, one is the same as true, and zero is the same as false. So this is going to return false for even numbers. It's going to return true for odd numbers. Okay, so if, if you look at these, the I in range 10 here, okay, we've got every number between zero and nine, half of those are going to be odd. So what this is going to do is say only for the odd numbers are we going to make a list of the squared values. All right, so we have one squared, three squared, five squared, seven squared, and nine squared. Okay, so these are actually really efficient because um, in this case, the compiler can look ahead and know what you're doing. It's not a compiler, it's an interpreter. So, the, so Python can look ahead and know what you're doing, and it can make a list of an exact size, okay, because it's going to do it in one operation. You could write some logic to make all this happen, and you could do this with a series of append operations, uh, but the append operations are relatively inefficient. Now, for, for this, it probably doesn't much matter. But once our range starts getting bigger, it really can. Okay, so that, that's a list comprehension. In fact, I, I'm gonna make this its own topic here. And we'll make it a subtopic. We're not gonna go into this now, but um, there are also um, comprehensions for dictionaries, predict objects, uh, and uh, sets. And there's, there's another one, I think sets. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, Python has several kinds of comprehensions. The syntax is all just about the same. But the idea is that um, you, if you have some kind of object you can iterate over, you can make a list 
you can make some transformation of the thing you're iterating over, and you can do a filtration object all in one step. All right. Um, there's another way to, to make a list. Um, and, you know, normally speaking, if you do an operation on a list, like you do um, uh, one, two, three, one, two, four, and you want to make a slice and go from zero to two, like this, you get back a list. And normally, if you do something with a string, you get a string back. Okay. Um, but it's possible to create a list from a string. Well, we saw one way to do that. Already, we used list and then we gave it a string. And uh, this is an iterable object. So we iterated over it and we created an element for each of the, the, the things in a list. Um, an, another thing we can do is we can take a string and uh, maybe it can be now is the time for all good dogs to bark. So, and uh, we can apply a split operation to that string. And that string is gonna create a list out of this. And by you can split on anything, but by default, it'll split on white space. So that'll make a list and it, will get rid of the character that it splits on. So it gets rid of all the white spaces and it takes each word and brings it into a list intact, like so. And if we wanted to make it split on any other character, of course we can by giving it some other character. All right, so that is a list. These are a couple of ways to make lists from strings. So I guess they, 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 they kind of count as constructors. Another thing you should know about these beasts is that um, uh, because they're mutable, Mutability has implications. Now, one of the implications is that um, if you assign different names to the same list, you're basically, basically making um, different names associated with the same object. And let me show you what I mean. Let's take a list, let's call it A, and let's make it equal to A, B, C. It's a fine list, right? Okay, now let's make a copy of that list. Let's, let's make B, let's make it equal to A and ask it what B is. Okay, so we got a copy of, we got a list and we got to copy the list. Now let's use our friend append and add something else to it, like D, and ask what A is. And we were able to add a new element to the back of it. But look what happened. B also has that change. Okay, so essentially we've got two names, A and B, they're assigned to the same object, this list. Now, when we went under the hood and we changed that object, we still have A and B, 
as being names associated with that object and both reflect the change. You gotta be kind of careful of that. And, and this extends to a lot of other objects you'll confront in Python. So for that reason, um, the list has a copy. So let's, let's say um, C is gonna be a copy of A. Okay, so we've got this object. Now, if we go ahead and add something to A, let's make it a bunch of E's. So A now reflects the E's. B will reflect the E's, but C will not, right? Because we made this hard copy. And, and, and by doing this, we've created a different object. So that object has nothing to do with the object that both A and B are associated with. Okay, questions on how that works? All righty. Um, let's see, what else? Yeah, okay, so let's just say we, um, let's make a new list. What are we up to? Q, R. Let's make a list called R. And um, let's make a, let's make this a list out of a range of three. Okay. And uh, we can extend that, or we can we can use a plus sign and make another list of range three. And we can use a plus sign and make a list of a range of four. Okay, so that, that gives us like 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, now, if we wanted to find something in here, like we wanted to find two, uh, we could ask it for the index of two. And that'll give us the index value of two. And that'll give us the first one. What if we wanted to find the second two? Well, we could make this a little more complicated. We could say r.index two. Okay. And we could make that the argument okay we could make that an argument of index because index has you you can just give it um a signature like look for Right. You can also give it a signature like look for uh, starting at. And you can also say end at. So, what this is going to do is it's going to return the index value for the element that you're looking for. Right, so we're looking for the element two, it finds it in position two. If we wanted to find the second one, we could have it start where the first one got found and maybe add one to it. So this is gonna find the second place where we have two. So zero, one, two, that's the first one, three, four, five. So you can um, apply the start at and end at index points, and you can search a substring or you know a, a sub index of the list to find the index value of an element you're looking for. That kind of sounds like gobbledygook, doesn't it? Um, and I agree. But if you study this 
later, you'll, you'll, it'll probably make a little more sense. So you can have um, a nested index calls to find elements. Okay, what else can you do? Um, you can get rid of stuff. Let's make a more interesting list. Let's call it S. And it can be a list of one, I guess this isn't that much more interesting. Let's make it a little more interesting. Let's say dog, cat, lion, and uh, I don't know, wildebeest. I don't know if that's how you spell wildebeest, but there's our list. Now, if we wanted to get rid of something, like I'm not a big fan of cats, um, we could we could ask um, Python to remove something. So we could say s dot remove cat. Okay, and. This is an in-place operation, like, like most of the, the things we've seen with the list. So it'll get rid of cat. Okay, now this doesn't return anything. Okay, so if we, um, let's execute this again. So we get our intact S and we say um, that, let's call this dead cat. Okay, and um, S is gonna reflect the fact that we, we've removed the cat. If we ask it for the dead cat, if we've asked it for the dead cat like so, we're not gonna get anything back because it returns a none object. So we can just ask if it's a non-object and it'll tell us, yep, it's a non-object. Now, if we wanted to return something from a list, um, uh, we've got a couple of ways to do it. Um, the easiest way is to use the pop method. So let's say we wanted to pop a lion, that's kind of close to a cat. So we could say s.pop like so. Um, but pop is going to work on an index. So actually, let, let's get rid of the, uh, the wilder, wilder beast first. Um, pop takes a value and the, uh, and it's the index of the thing to get rid of. Okay. And it defaults at negative one, right? So if we just ask it to pop something, it's gonna get rid of the wildebeest and it's gonna return it. So now if we say dead beast equals s dot pop, it's gonna drop the wildebeest off the end and return it. All right, so if, if you wanna simultaneously pop something off a list and be able to do something with that value, you can do it really easily. If you, let's look at S again. Let's put the cat back in. Um, so S dot, and the cat. So if we wanted to get rid of the lion, well, the lion isn't the last element. It's element one. So we can say s.pop one. And we can call this dead lion if we wanted to capture it. We don't have to capture anything. It'll return it. If we don't assign it to a name, uh, that's fine. We don't have to. 
that'll give us our lion out of our list and our S will be short. So the use case of, of, of uh, getting rid of stuff like this is if you're, let's just say you've got a, um, uh, a bunch, let's say you've got a bunch of tags, you've asked somebody, uh, your users to provide tags that describe your website. And you don't know how many tags anybody is going to return. Well, you can you can return it as a list and keep going through it. And and, and as long as the the list has anything in it, you can keep popping things off it. And you can pop one thing at a time. You can assign the thing it pops off to a name. And you can process it. I don't know. You can put it in your database of tags. And every time you do that, your, your original list gets shorter. So that gives you an easy way to keep checking in on your list and putting it in some kind of iterating structure. And no matter how many tags your users put in, you'll be able to, to grab them all and process them all. OK. Um, let's see. So we did a remove and we did a pop. What else can we do here? Uh, oh, you can also count things. So if you, um, if you had a, a list, I hate to do this. Let's just say we had a, a list of cat and we made a list with 10 cats in it. Kind of makes me itch, I'm allergic to the things. So let's call this cats. Okay, we'll ask it to report cats. Now we can ask it for a count. So we can say cats dot count. And we can ask it for how many cats are in there. And this will go ahead and count them up and tell us there's 10 cats. If we wanted to say, we want to upgrade our cats and give it a dog, uh, we can do that. And now if we said cats.count dog, it'll tell us there's one. So you've got a, you've got a ton of ways to, uh, to work with these lists. Um, working with a combination of indices, insertions, um, additions through append or extend. Um, so you, you, can, you can use a list and kind of make it like clay in your hands to mold it. All right. Anybody have questions? All right, so let's just have a quick look. And make sure we haven't missed anything here. We've done append. Okay, we haven't done clear. Let's look really. Uh, oh yeah, then I wanted to show you reverse. Um, let's say cats. And if we said cats dot clear. Yeah, got rid of all the cats. Okay, it got rid of the dog too, but we got rid of a lot of cats. Okay, and again, an in place operation and we have an empty list. Now the cool thing about that is we've kept the name cats in our namespace. So the interpreter still knows what it is. Right? It's not gonna return a name error or anything like that. So if, if we were actually popping things off a, off a list, that would retain the, the, the name in our namespace, right? And if we clear it, we're retaining the name in our namespace. If we wanted to delete it, we could do that. You don't use this a lot, but this is Python's destructor. Okay, so that got rid of it. Now, if we ask it for cats, we'll get a name error because the interpreter doesn't know what the hell we're talking about anymore. All right, um, there's a, 
yeah, there, there's, there's two other things I wanted to tell you about here. And uh, one is reverse and the other is sort. So if we had a list, call it T, and we'll make it um, A and uh, B and uh, D and uh, A again and B again. So that'll give it this list. Now we can say t.sort, like so. And what it'll, what it'll do is automatically sort everything inside. Okay. Um, we can, it doesn't really matter what we put in here. It'll work with numbers. Okay, and it'll sort them. And basically it, it sorts it um, uh, per the ordinal value of the object. Uh, what does that mean? Um, Python has a built-in called ord, and it'll give you the uh, ASCII um, point for that. Okay, so, so whatever, whatever ORD returns is going to be the sort key. It's possible to provide a custom key if you want to. Um, let me just put in another one of these. Okay, and, and, and you can look that up if you want to, but it, it's possible to sort it uh, 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 by something besides this ORD value, but uh, this will be the default basis. Okay, and just for the heck of it, you should know that the opposite of ORD is CHR. So if you want to give it that ASCII point, and ask it to bring out the ASCII value, you can do that. Okay. Uh, another thing I would point out is, um, you saw we did an in, in place operation on T. Um, what, you, what you never wanna do is say something like T equals T dot sort. Uh, because what you'll find out is, It returns a non object. So you'll, you'll sort it, but if you, if you do a reassignment operation, um, you're screwed because you'll lose your list. Okay. Um, let's get T back here. And I'll just copy this here. Okay. Um, there, there's something else you can do called um, sorted T. Now, sorted isn't connected to a list object, um, but it's 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 part of Python's main library. This will actually return something. So we'll call it ST. Okay. And, and ST is, uh, is, is, is an iterable object, it's a list, okay? And sorted you can use against a bunch of stuff. So if you really need to return a value, uh, you, you can go outside of the list object into Python and, uh, and get something else. All right, so let's look at T one more time. And you can say t dot reverse, and it'll do pretty much what you think. It'll it'll do it from beginning to end. In another in place operation, so you don't want to say t equals t dot reverse because you'll end up with the same situation that you got into here. All right. 
So we're about to the end of our time together. We've covered a lot of stuff here. Um, does anybody have questions? I had a question. question. Yes. Uh, the negative indexing. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. It was like uh, from a range to a range minus one. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you can find that one. I was kind of confused. I wasn't sure why oh. you got that output. Yeah. Yeah. I think this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it's this one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, let me elaborate then a bit. So this is P. Okay. Now, if we say P and we do a, a slice on it, P. What we'll get is 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 P backward because our stride is minus one. Okay. So we'll just okay. go from 10 to nine to eight, et cetera. Um, now we can, we can elaborate this a little bit and just do a chunk of P. So we can go from P starting at, at index point eight and going to index point two and go minus one. And that'll, that'll reverse um, uh, a bit of P. Okay, okay. So the minus one pretty much means go ba uh, backwards, right? Yeah, from exactly. eight to two. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And if you wanted to get even fancier, you could say p, and you go from eight to two, and say minus two. That'll do a negative two stride, and bring every other value of our original list between these two index points into a new list. Okay, now makes more sense, thank you. All right, good question, awesome. Anybody else? All right, well, again, I'm very grateful that, uh, that you spent part of your Saturday with me. Uh, I hope you found it worthwhile. I think you learned a lot of good stuff and certainly all this stuff is gonna be useful if you're uh, gonna pursue Python or or just about anything involving uh, numerical analysis or array manipulation. All the principles are gonna work under the hood. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I will see you again next week. Uh, in the meantime, I will save these class notes. I will drop them into the class chat in Slack and you'll have access to them and uh, you know, feel free to accumulate any further questions and ask me at the top of the next class. I will be happy to answer them. So take care and Thank you, uh, good night. Thank you.